So today we are joined with Michael. He is actually calling in from Thailand. Uh, he managed to get there uh, right before they close up the borders uh, with everything going on in the world. But just another amazing, amazing student interview. Michael's making anywhere from eight to twelve thousand dollars a month profit. Um, and as I said, like I just love meeting agency owners who just know what they want. Like they know what they want. Michael does not want to make 30, 40, 50 K a month. Like he is so happy making eight to 12 K a month. His personal expenses are 1500 a month and he's living in a $3,000 a month uh, villa at the moment. And we'll get onto how that actually makes sense. But he spends $1,500 a month. Um, and we were talking about, you know, uh, we were talking about having a moat. We were talking about cash reserves and he really doesn't need to work for the next four or five years because he's very frugal, but he gets a lot of bang for his buck in terms of he doesn't have very high expenses, but he lives an incredible lifestyle. And uh, and just the fact that, yeah, he has so many, uh, so much in cash reserves. So even if his agency didn't make a, a, an ounce of profit for the next two years, keep in mind, he works with contractors, not really full-time team members, or he has, I think he has one full-time team member. So um, that's the thing, like you don't, a contractor only gets paid once you get paid. You know, it's only once you bring someone on full time, which I only recommend far down the road or once you have experience and you know that there's consistent cash flow coming in. But anyways, long story short, he could pay his entire contractor staff for two years, uh, once again, without even a penny of profit. Um, because yeah, he just has cash reserves. So I, a lot of ways I've done student interviews with students making 50, 60, 70 K a month profit. In a lot of ways, I even love these student interviews with people making just like, eight, 10, 12, we had another one with uh, Evan. And um, yeah, you know, people just making, I think Evan's making around five, $6,000 a month. Uh, obviously Michael's making anywhere from eight to 12. Not as impressive numbers, but these guys are just, just total badasses. They know what they want uh, and they've built their agency around the life that they want. So I'm babbling on now. So uh, I'll let the student interview roll. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another student interview. We are here today with Michael Gardner, Coming in from, uh, how do you pronounce it? Because it. Phuket. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, I don't want to pronounce it the other way that people usually pronounce it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, right now, uh, Michael's calling in from a $3,000. And by the way, in, in Thailand, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to Bali, like Bali, Thailand, um, those sorts of places, like $3,000 will get you far. So, he's, yes. he's, he's yes. currently calling in from a $3,000 a month uh, villa that he had to pay. Zero four, and do you kind of want to explain the situation behind that? Sure. So I was actually in Bangladesh a few weeks ago, um, but due to the current virus situation, I had to leave because of the bad infrastructure. I managed to book a last-minute flight to fly Thailand, and I didn't get in. Um, it was very difficult to get in, and I got in actually six hours before they completely shut down the country to tourism. Um, booked a last-minute place, and it happened to be someone who has nine villas here that are on Airbnb. And one thing that I'm always trying to do is like make people know what I do. So the first night, you know, sat down with the owner, got to know him, told him what I did. By the end of the night, I negotiated three months of free rent in exchange for consulting. So that's $9,000 in, in rent completely waived. And uh, I was joking with Michael off camera that like being a digital marketer in 2020 is like the new influencer. Like you could just arbitrage your way to anything. Uh, but you also don't have that uh, soul sucking um, uh, pit in your stomach that, you know, you post like four thong photos <laughs> a month <laughs> instead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we do it with ethics. But um, no, that, that, that's awesome. And that's one of the main reasons I want to get on you, uh, get you on here because of just how, um, I mean, that, that's kind of something uh, offline where you can just see how uh, crafty and nimble and just like lean and efficient you are. And this is also why you are, you are always going to be fine. Like for the rest of your life, you are fine. And um, we'll get into that. Just how, um, how, you, how you extract profit from the business, how you're just super, you live frugally, but you live an incredible lifestyle, um, how you travel a ton, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, real quick, you want to tell them on average how much your agency makes, uh, how many clients per month you work with. Cause once again, that's uh, it's a little unorthodox your, uh, your standard price point, the niches you work with, the services you offer. Um, it's unorthodox, but it works. Yeah. So right now my agency normally does between eight to $12,000 a month profit. 
Um, I have a few clients on pause with the virus situation right now, but on a normal month, eight to 12 in profit. And our average client is around $750 per month. We typically look, work with lower ticket clients because we're getting them off Upwork um, for the most part. So we normally have between like 10 to 15 clients per month. And we also do a lot of one-off projects, which is a bit different. Not everybody's on a retainer. And um, as far as the services I offer, I have my main agency, which is based out of the United States. We do your typical Facebook, Google, social media management. And I actually have a freelancer management company in Kolna, Bangladesh, which does low level like social media work, like posting, um, graphic design, follow and follow. They can do websites, data entry, virtual assistant tasks, really anything you would hire on Upwork under $10 an hour. I have a team of 25 guys who does all of that. So Michael is the kingpin behind all of that. Um, <laughs> so um, that's awesome. And uh, you want to tell me, because you said you brought on four clients last month. You want to tell me, yeah. I don't know if you can reveal what niches they are, because it's just super unorthodox, but I find it so interesting. Sure. So I normally work with local businesses. However, last month, I didn't really worry about getting local clients because I just needed revenue. Um, and last month, I got a language school. I got a podcast consultant. I actually have a Muslim prophet trying to build his personal brand. And lastly, I have someone who's doing in-home tile installation. So those nests don't have anything to do with each other. Um, but right now, just taking what I can get. Mm, amazing. So do all of your clients exclusively uh, come from Upwork? No, they don't all come from Upwork. I probably do about five to six outreach methods on a regular basis. However, Upwork is 80% of all my clients coming from there. Okay. So how much time a week would you say you spend on Upwork trying to get clients? So I actually have a whole system where I spend no time on Upwork. I have someone who applies for 40 jobs a day for me. I have already made a giant document of every possible question they could ask. I have different application messages and actually custom videos I've recorded in my applications for every single niche. I have video case studies from clients that I attached to my application. So 40 to 50 applications done per day passively. I spend $5 a day for someone to do that. And I actually have a sales guy who goes on to my Upwork and corresponds with them. And then he talks to them on the phone and sells them. So it is very hands off for me unless I find something that really interests me. And I personally want to be on the sales call or record like a custom application video, with my, um, my cover letter. Mm, so you, oh man, this gets me so excited. Uh, this gets me so excited. Cause I love, I love seeing the spectrum of like, like for example, do you, uh, you live in your fucking best life. <laughs> like you're living your best life. You're making like a 10, uh, you know, 10 K a month on average. And like, I, I know you, you're, you're very similar to me in a sense that like you're so systems and processes oriented. And like, I, I genuinely think those are just the best people in the world. Cause I think, I think those people, uh, people like that are just the people who like conquer the world and, and conquer whatever they do. Um, but it also doesn't seem like you really have that big of a desire to get to like 40, 50 K a month. Cause I don't even know. I don't even think you know what you, uh, you, you know what to do with that sort of money. Um, cause also how much, uh, like how much are your monthly personal costs? Um, it's stupid low. I mean, I probably average like always under $50 a day. So it, it's not much. I mean, I probably yeah. average somewhere around like $40 a day in personal expenses between accommodation, flights, food, recreation, all of it, which is, it's really low. Cause I, okay. I move around a lot too. Amazing. So there's a lot that I want to unpack here, uh, about the agency, but, um, you know, we talk obviously on these student interviews, I talk a lot with people about their agency, but uh, you know, um, I think people also love to find out like, okay, what do you do outside? Like, how do you actually spend your money? How do you, uh, uh set up your life? How do you actually design your lifestyle? So you're, you, you know, you, you say you're falling under $50 a day, but I also know you're not living frugally. It's not like you're penny pinching, no. like that, that's going a long way for you. So what are some ways that, you, uh, or, or what are some things that you're doing to, to basically maximize your bang for buck? Sure. So the biggest thing is travel is actually cheaper than living, um, especially in a first world country. I mean, I've lived in London and I was spending like $300 a week on mediocre food, you know, um, 
where here in Thailand, I can spend $300 a week and I can cover everything. But um, yeah, I spent a lot of time in Asia, not necessarily just because of the cost, because I really enjoy Asia. Um, I, I travel pretty much full time. And one thing too, is like, I don't spend money on first class or business class flights. You know, I'm booking rather economy flights. Um, I found that if you book an economy flight, but you book $20 extra for an exit row, it's kind of like being business class, I think. Um, I have the leg room mm-hmm. I need. I'm, I'm a tall guy. So, I mean, most of my money goes towards flights. As far as Airbnbs go, you know, Airbnb is extraordinarily cheap if you book ahead. And I normally book months ahead. And I've actually gone as far as hiring people to help me find the best prices on flights and Airbnbs, you know, virtual assistants. So, you know, they can spend three, four hours and it will cost me, say, 15 bucks. But that person going to that research might save me, you know, two, three hundred dollars. So really all my money goes towards flights, food, and accommodation. Um, I live out of a backpack and a suitcase, so it's not like I need too many things. Uh, And that's really where it goes. And experiences, I mean, when I travel, I like to do fun things, whether it's like, you know, going on a guided hike or skydiving or um, a whole bunch of different experiences. Mm, okay, so that actually answers one of my questions because I was about to ask you uh, with Airbnb is because obviously they have the audio, Iman. Ah, is it good now? There we go. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, that's that actually answers one of my questions because I was going to ask you um, in terms of flights and in terms of Airbnbs, like Airbnb, Airbnbs, are you messaging them and you know, let's say the sticker price is like thirty dollars a night? Are you messaging them and trying to negotiate it, negotiate, uh, negotiate it down to eighteen? I have done that, but I don't do that always. Um, for flights, one trick I have is I use Kiwi. Kiwi for my flights, it's the best tool to book flights because what they do is they have flights that aren't connected. So like when you have a layover, your bag transfers to the other airline. That's because that's a partner airline. They have flight connections that aren't partners. So like on my layovers, I have to go for immigration, get my bag and go back through immigration. And that may be you know a little bit more work, but I mean, I get ridiculously cheap flights. I could name a couple prices and they're just absurd. And I'm also not using credit card hacking because I'm actually so young that my credit limits are all pretty bad. I don't get approved for cards just because of um, not having history and credit. Um, So this is my way of traveling economically without just using credit cards. Mm, Wow. Yeah. Because that, once again, would have been one of my next questions is, are you doing any credit card hacking? Yeah. All right. Okay. Perfect. So so that's that. And um, in terms of traveling and still running your agency uh any tips for people who want to live that digital nomad lifestyle and um also my other question would be how long are you staying in a place you're usually in a place for two uh two weeks a month three months uh and as i said just any tips for like actually maintaining focus while you're traveling and living that sort of digital nomad lifestyle i think the biggest thing you'll run into trying to have a digital nomad lifestyle is time zones do suck there's no getting around that um, and I personally, I don't want to get up at 6 a.m. and then stay up to 11 p.m. I have a full-time employee back home who's not only just an employee, but he's someone I have like a deep personal relationship with. Um, he's kind of like a, my Pierre and to you, I guess. Um, his, his name is mm-hmm. Phil and he's in Boston. So he can handle any sales call. He can handle any customer support call. Every client I have knows who Phil is. He actually manages a lot of my contractors, a lot of my campaigns. So I don't need to worry about staying up till midnight for a phone call or rushing for a phone call. I take phone calls in the morning at night, but at reasonable times. I think that's one of the only real difficulties I had at first being a digital nomad. But if you can find someone in the States, whether it's a partner or just a really good contractor that you can trust to handle your phone calls, it'll make your life so much easier. And as far as how much time I'm spending, when I first started traveling was about 18. I actually did my first solo trip to India. It was my first trip. I was 18. I'm 20 now. Uh, just turned 20. And I mean, last year, I think I went to like 16 or 17 countries, but I was doing it very fast. And what I found is I had a really fun time, but I never truly got settled. So when I started traveling this year, the least amount of time I'll spend somewhere is two weeks, but an average is probably three weeks to a month, just because that gives me enough time that I could actually get into a little bit of a routine. Um, so I, I don't like routine, but some routine I think is necessary. So that way I can get into a little bit of a routine. I can get to actually know some people, make some friends. And I think that's a good amount of time. So I don't think trying to go to a new country every week is really sustainable. Um, I'm sure you could make it sustainable, but to me, it's just, it feels like a hassle. I'm not enjoying it. 
I'm really enjoying it where I can unpack my luggage and know that I have a whole month before I have to repack it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And uh, I, <clears throat> I definitely, by the, uh, by the end of 2018, I got to a point where I was like, honestly, just fuck traveling. Cause I think I went to like 14, 15 different countries in, um, in 2018. Uh, a lot of it was for business and work, but a lot of it was like three days, five days a month, yeah, yeah. like a week, a, a week, this, that. Um, and then 2019, I'm like, all right, cool. I'm just going to bunker down. I'm not going to travel. Now, actually, I'm, I'm really enjoying traveling, but for like two, three months. Obviously, I've been in Cape Town here for like three months. There's no real point going back to London right now. If yeah. I'm going to quarantine, I might as well quarantine in a, in a beautiful villa. Somewhere beautiful. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, I definitely, I can definitely agree with that. Like, I genuinely think you're going to just wreck your business if you're traveling every week, two weeks, getting settled in, resettled, et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's amazing if you can travel for like, a month to a place or two months and the other thing is if you can halfway through your trip if you can um i found this person if you can swap uh where you're living like this is my th i've been in cape town for three months so this is my yeah three and a half months this is my third place i've been at uh and i feel as though after like yeah. six weeks in an actual like location in a house or an apartment you don't get that um inspiration that you initially get when you come to a new uh, I know a, a new mean, environment yeah. you know what i mean you so I think it's nice to just kind of swap around the like actual the actual spot you're staying in as well. Yeah, I do that sometimes too. I'll fly into, for example, a tourist area. And I might spend two weeks in a highly touristed area, then two weeks more in a local area. I feel it gives you a better experience. Like you said, that new spark of inspiration is definitely true. And, and one thing I want to add too is I didn't like build my, I didn't start building my businesses while traveling. I've been doing this since 2015. So it took me years of, living a relatively boring life to get to the point where I could have like a, I guess an exciting life. It, you know, it took a lot of years at home, just sitting, you know, working, thinking, planning to get to this point I'm at now. I don't think that I, I could have, but it would have been a lot more difficult to have to manage traveling while actually building a business because quite honestly, traveling is a little bit like having its own job mm -hmm. as far as the so planning. The, the, the next question I have for you is obviously, you know, most months you're doing anywhere from eight to 12 K, um, but your agency has taken a, a substantial hit over the past yes. month. And, uh, you know, we talked about it over cause you know, you, you've got four five, six local clients, um, that you've had to put yeah. on pause, um, not ended, uh, but had to put on pause. So obviously that revenue you might not see for 30 or 60 days. It kind of depends how things yeah. go. Um, but you're just so nonchalant about it. And, you know, I want you to touch on this, but like, you genuinely couldn't care less. And um, that's because you've got incredible cash reserves. And I've always preached and I've told people and, um, you know, for example, when people uh, come into copy paste agency, which is a higher level program of agency incubator, um, which is only available to agency incubator students at the moment, but that is like the number one focus. Like you, you just have this, um, you just have such an abundant uh, mind frame and you just have to be honest, to be quite honest, you just have fucking balls when you've got cash in the bank and you know that you've got a run rate of a year, two years, three years. Like I, honestly, similar to you, like I could live a pretty decent, I could live a pretty decent lifestyle and not have to work for like 20 years. So like <laughs> I really couldn't care less what happens. And when you have that bulletproof confidence, um, it just does so much for you. So you want to touch a little bit on the fact that like, you know, the past month, your agency has taken a hit, sure. but you're not really concerned. And um, you would rather help your clients keep that relationship um, than, you know, try to keep the retainer going. Yeah. So last month, my agency made a profit that uh, I'll just say is not livable, not due to negligence or anything. It's just part of being a business owner. Um, almost 80% of my clients are on pause. And what I mean by on pause is I had local businesses where they just can't advertise and instead of pushing a contract, I just told them, look, we'll pause it. We're not going to charge you anything. Those remaining days will come back whenever your business can open. And that way I'm keeping good relationships. You know, all my clients are really grateful for that. And in 30, 60, 90 days, whatever, they'll snap back to it. But one of the nice things is because I live so frugal and I don't really have any crazy expenditures, I have built up personally a large cash reserve and also for my business. So if I really need to, I could pay my contractors and employees for the next couple of years. I mean, not that I want to do it without profit, but if I have to break even or just make a few thousand dollars for the next couple of months, I know that my clients will be happy 
my contractors and employees can still afford for rent, for food, to help their families. And I myself don't have to make any lifestyle sacrifices. And I think part of that is, is just because I, I didn't go from living like a fancy life to all of a sudden now I'm cutting back. I just live within my means. Um, the things that make me happy are not expensive. And I can just maintain that now. And that's something I'm grateful that I got myself prepared for over the last five years of this entrepreneurial journey. Mm, that's amazing. And, um, and that's also the, the other beauty of having an agency is, I mean, maybe like one or two months max, but still very unlikely is as an agency, you're never going to bleed money because it's like, you're not paying your contractors. Or you're not really paying your team unless you have agency clients. And unless you're, and realistically, you don't have a full-time team member unless you're at a point where you've been doing this long enough, six months, 12 months. And like, you know, yeah. that no matter what, like worst case scenario, worst, worst case scenario, you're going to break even. So that's the beautiful thing about having an agency. Uh, whereas, I mean, you look at all these other businesses right now, like they are bleeding cash. Even just another example, like I had to put it forward another well over five figure in stock uh, for the e-commerce, uh, my e-commerce line, Gadgie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Guess what? Our, our factory is closed. Our second factory, we thought we could, uh, we could move forward with that. That's closed as well. So now I got a hell of a lot of money tied up in stock for this new season. I won't see for God knows how long, you know? And yeah. I know that's, uh, you know, that's w just one example of one business. I can't even imagine what it'd be like if I had rent. And this is also why I keep telling people. I've had clients, actually one client of mine shut down fully because of rent. They had 8,000, I think a month in rent. And they just had to shut down, just couldn't pay it. it you see, you see, that's nuts. And that, this is also why, like, I've always, as at greatagency.com, we've built this common, like, we've built this common enemy of just the really fucking pretentious, like, agency owner who is like, oh, I make 50K a month. And it's like, no, 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 you, you, you pocket 6K a month. Like, get your head out yeah. your ass. My, like, like, Michael makes more money than you. <laughs> and he works, like, four hours a day and lives an incredible lifestyle. You are like on the brink of like a caffeine addiction and like having a mental breakdown and you think you're the shit because you have a 6,000 pound office. Well, you've just got to have a business. So this is why it's so important to have a boutique agency, uh, agency that focuses on the thing, on what matters the most, which is at the end of the day results and your clients don't give a shit whether you have an office or not. Um, and yeah, I just think I, like, you know, I guess this is the first ever sort of uh, financial downturn that I've ever gone through. And I'm sure that you've ever gone through. And it's just I like- I think almost oh, everybody in the GMA community. I think- Yeah, yeah. For, for yeah, all of us. yeah, you know, and it's like, and I'm just so happy and I'm so proud that like for years I've been instilling in people like resourcefulness, lean, be lean, build up your cash reserves. Because it's like, you know, very few people are- not, not too many people survive times like this, but the ones that do, oh my God, they, they flourish. So that's awesome. To the see. nice like thing is said. it brings opportunities where if you have a cash reserve, I'm looking to go into real estate and I'm cost averaging buying index funds every week. I mean, my goal is to come out of this personally, financially a lot better than I went into it. Mm, ex exactly. So um, now it's just a, in a lot of ways, it's a, it's a very, very exciting time. So let's get back to the agency specifically. So obviously you've got sure. someone managing the Upwork. So the thing that brings in 80% of your clients, you don't even do yourself, which is awesome. Um, and, and you said that you pay them more, like five, $5 a day? It's normally like five to $10 a day for them to send out those applications. Uh, okay. Amazing. It's now nice. you're also the king of, uh, what does Kieran call you again? Um, grow your agency's most unconventional student. There we go. Yeah. So you're also just a king at uh, bringing in potential clients through other means. So you said, you know, yes. you have, you have four or five different means. Obviously Upwork is, is the main bulk of it, but what, what, what are some other stuff that you that you're doing that has worked and maybe some stuff that you tried and, and didn't really work that well? Sure. So the first way I got clients, which still works, but I don't do it is I used to print flyers and go door to door and just pitch the person behind the counter, whether they were an employee, owner, manager, I didn't care. At that point, I was 15. What I would do is print 100 flyers and go to the downtown, and I wouldn't leave until I passed out those flyers. And that actually was like a really strong source of clients for my first year. Um, but more recently, um, some of the ways we've gotten clients, I'll name some of the ones that are a bit unconventional, because I think they're kind of fun. We've actually done letters in the mail. And inside the letters, we give gift cards, like $5 gift cards. 
that way the client feels guilty if they don't respond of a mm. potential client. Um, one thing is TikTok. TikTok has been a beast for me. And I think that um, me telling Kieran about TikTok so much finally is what convinced you to get on the platform. No, 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 no. It's, it's not like, it's not like it had a role. To, it's like Kieran for fucking two months wouldn't stop talking to me about TikTok. He's like, do, do a TikTok, do it. Like, look at Michael's shit. Like he's doing so, I'm like, dude, shut up. Like, <laughs> this is not, TikTok is not for me. But um, yeah, eventually he cracked me and uh, we've done it. And we actually just hired someone uh, now to uh, put out two TikToks a day, just mm. scrape stuff for my YouTube. Cause I, I I just don't have the patience to do that stuff myself. I mean, TikTok for me is crazy because uh, I don't do too much of a coaching stuff, but I'll do consulting calls and occasional coaching. I've gotten actual clients from my agency. I've gotten coaching clients and I hired one of my best contractors all from TikTok. And that's in a matter of, you know, <laughs> like three months, maybe four months um, to mm. on the platform. And I've actually been growing my YouTube and Instagram more from TikTok than actually on the planet, um, on the actual platforms. Jesus. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So y you have a, you have quite a few different uh, methods. One thing, and this is just like a total um, side tangent, side track mm -hmm. that came to me was you're such a lean, um, I was going to say frugal, but to be honest, you're not really even frugal because you live a great lifestyle. You just know how to get most bang for your buck. So let's say, you know, your average, uh, you know, you're, and you're living well, your monthly expenses are anywhere from like 12 to $1,500 a month. My question is, why did you uh, join my program. Um, like I feel yeah, so especially so, for someone like you, you'd be like, that is too much. <laughs> so I had moved to London. I, before I dropped out of college, I was studying abroad in London and, um, I'd always followed you on social media. You know, I think I came from the same video that most people watching this video originally saw of a high school dropout video yeah. and I'd always <laughs> followed you, but I've in general, I've kind of in general, I've kind of despised online courses and yours has been, I've maybe purchased three and yours has been the only one I don't regret um, or I feel at least satisfied with. So um, you were having your party in London and I wanted to meet more entrepreneurs and just kind of grow my network a bit. So I just came to London and everybody at the university, you know, I had plenty of friends I could, you know, go out with, but no one I could have really a deep conversation with or talk about business. So for me, um, and I actually had one of my employees um, studying abroad with me too. So for me, I think I messaged you and said, hey, if I join your um, I remember, course, I can I come this. to the party and can I bring my employee? Um, and I figured if I get to me out of the course or the Facebook group, great, whatever. Um, and I ended up joining just to come to that party, but I ended up also getting a lot out of a course. And I think more than the course, I got so much out of the networking and the Facebook group. I mean, I have, mm -hmm. like, for example, you remember, um, and then I went to the mastermind, which I had no expectation to go to it. I just figured, you know, it would normally cost me a thousand dollars round trip to get from home to London and back. I was already here. So why not go ahead and go to it? I mean, it was 15 minutes from my apartment. Um, and one thing, I don't know if you know, but one of the guys I went to the mastermind with yep. Lucas from Germany, <laughs> yep. we lived together in Thailand for a while working together. So I think the biggest thing for me, like the value from the course has just been um, the networking. I mean, I feel like I um, know you and I definitely know Karen pretty well. And I'm, I just at least, 10 guys in a group I can message at any time and just talk on the phone and a couple guys in the group I'm like on really close personal terms with just an accountability and just someone who genuinely cares about me so the community is is really strong I mean some of the other courses I've joined are very like all about money and kind of cocky and flashy and braggy and I feel like the grow your agency community almost has like this I don't know very wise humble mm. kind of caring vibe to it compared to the um, let me flash, flash my wealth kind of vibe. You find a lot of uh, other make money online groups and courses. Mm, yeah, I mean, I definitely uh, I agree with that. And I keep saying that there's a certain person who resonates with um, with the ethos of the company and the way we go about things and our students. Like, as you said, like every single student we have is very um, not only in, in just inside of the business, uh, outside of the business, they really have their shit together. Uh, and they're growing in, in every single way. Kieran actually asked me to ask about the cat. Okay, oh, the cat. <laughs> that could mean if I, oh yeah. I don't, I don't know what he means. Mean. Okay. <laughs> I don't know um, if I caught you off guard on an actual I, interview. Laid back, and there's a lot of stray cats in Thailand, so I just leave my, like behind this, I don't close because the beach is like right there. Um, but 
I have, there's been stray cats that come around my apartment. So I just started leaving the, the door open and I've had like some stray cats living with me. Like they come in my bed <laughs> at night and sleep with me. Um, I think that's what he meant, but I think one of them hopped up in front of a camera or something when they were calling. I mean, I, I have no idea what their names uh, are, if they have an owner, but I don't know. I'm just, I'm too easy going, I think. Uh-huh. <laughs> All right. So look, you know, uh, and I, I guess the thing is you're, you, you have your operations and everything so dialed in. Um, for me still, like I have anxiety, like we're actually about to, I don't know if I should reveal this yet. Uh, okay. Probably by the time this goes out, I'll be fine. But like, uh, I'm actually just about to redo the, uh, the IG media website. I've been fighting with the team for probably like a month. Uh, I want to rebrand the name cause we don't even do media anymore. So I just think it's dumb. So I've been trying to get, there's a couple uh, domains that I'm looking to buy. I'm talking like very expensive domains, very like, uh, just very, very sick names. Yeah. Um, and I want to do a rebrand of the agency, but um, the team likes the fact that it like almost how ironic it is that we're still like called IG media, even though we don't do media and they like kind of that, like basically they don't want, they don't want uh, us to try to make ourselves try to sound cool. Like we like the fact that it's almost like fucking hilarious that you're still IG media, just this really shitty name. Uh, but anyways, long story short on my website, uh, we're, we're doing a, a new website rebrand because the current one is like, I love the, just how shit my agency website is and the caliber of clients we've gone. And I love the fact that I made, I, I proved such a point that first of all, for a long time, uh, in 2018, my biggest rate of growth was when my agency was, uh, agency website was down for like four or five months. Uh, and then after that, just this really janky, shitty website. Uh, but on the new website, we're about to, um, as you scroll down, it'll be like off, uh, services we offer, like content creation, graphic design, this, 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 and it's just gonna have an X on all of them. And just gonna say at the bottom, like ads, just ads. That's kind of like cool. That, like, like that's all we, like, we just want to make fun of like all the agencies out there. Um, not yours included, but that yeah. are just like trying to throw in extra shit just because, and they don't even actually do it. Um, so my, you know, this is a really long circle to get back to a point that like, I get anxiety about any complexity. Like m literally most of my life is spent, um, trying to scale up what I have in the agency, uh, trying to scale up what I have in the education company, the clothing line. Like for example, right now, uh, we're, I'm rehiring appointment setters and I'm just trying to like, uh, figure out this decentralized approach like Danny's going to be actually managing the appointment setters so he's kind of uh, moving up and I'm actually going to get Danny to hire another media buyer this year and we're going to try to scale the 200k a month profit and but it's like this is I'm bringing on complexity and complexity gives me anxiety because I know that things break with added complexity you on the other hand dude you're fucking chilling with like more complexity than you, you generally have more complexity in your agency than anyone else in the great agency community like not even by like a little bit by like a a fat margin yet you match to, to make it all work. So are there other, uh, ever times where you, you look at your agency and you're like, maybe I should strip away some stuff, remove some complexity. Uh, or are you just saying, Hey, don't, don't fix what's not broken. I mean, I didn't always have any systems. Like I didn't have a website for my first three years. Um, on, <laughs> you're talking about the website. So I think that's kind of funny. I, I think really my strong point is hiring. I mean, I genuinely have people working for me who care about me and have my best interests. And one thing too is my contractors. I know them in person. I have flown to India and I have gotten shy with my contractors. I have been in Bangladesh and I've been in the family homes of my contractors and sat down eight for families. All of my contractors have like truly my best interests. And a lot of them even look at me a little bit kind of like people in the agency community look at you, I guess. Um, mm. Cause I've spent time with them and built relationships. So really um, offering a lot of services isn't hard for me. Cause I know I have people who do all the services and I have full-time employees who actually manage the communication between, you know, those contractors and my clients. So for me, it doesn't feel like a burden. Um, or I could see if you're starting out and it was just you, don't do everything. You're just going to create a headache. But if you can build those connections of contractors, I don't just mean find a random contractor on Upwork, like actually build a, a relationship with contractors who can fulfill those other services. I, I think it's not really too bad. And I, especially because I actually bought the company in Bangladesh that does a lot of that low level social media management, data entry, virtual assistant, you know, that, that makes it a lot easier too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And I always tell people, you know, th there's no such thing as a contractor. There's a team member. And I'm not just saying that to make it sound cleaner or more pure. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. Like in our company, there's the core. And once you're in the core,
like at the moment right now, it's pretty much Danny, uh, Danny, Kieran, uh, myself, and now Max. Like that's the core. once you're the core, like you get, there's a lot of perks with being the core of the company. Then there's people on the outer sphere, people, uh, members of the team, Caden, Nikolai, um, Esteban, et cetera, et cetera. Some people in the background, they're like, people have no clue even exist. Um, you know, but to me, that's still team. And I still take care of team. And even my team, I reimburse if they ever uh, want books, I reimburse their book fees. Uh, whether Same they're here, they're, actually. There we go. You, you know, and it's, it's it, when you do that for your team, I, I agree, it just builds. Uh, it builds a lot of loyalty. But one thing that I want to ask you, because I get people asking me all this all the time, and I could probably make a 45 minute, 50 minute video on it, is people ask, even at the mastermind, uh, they ask Kieran, because Kieran has, like, in terms of uh, experience, like, technically, Kieran even has more experience than me, because he's managed 400 grand a month in retainers. Granted, it was more traditional media, but like, people ask Kieran, like, Kieran, you are more qualified than 99.99% of the like social media marketing gurus in the industry. Like, why are you still working for Guru agency and the product manager and this and that? Or I get people asking Danny, like, Hey Danny, you know, why don't you ever go start your own thing? And I built such a incredible team. And I talk with my team in 10, 15 year horizons. We don't talk like, yes, we talk what's going to happen three months from now. But I think the two true tests of a team is like I said, we're talking 15 years down the line. Uh, what are we going to do? So I built such an incredible team. And as you said, like we have this common mission and vision and goal. Um, my question to you is like with Phil, like how have you engineered it to a point where like, surely you might be thinking sometimes like, oh, well, fuck, this dude basically does run the business. What if he just decides to fuck off? Sure. So Phil came to me for my personal brand on Instagram um, back in the day. And I think part of the reason Phil is so loyal and such a good friend to me is I started him help. I helped him start some businesses for free before he was even applied to work for me. You know, I, I, what's it? Gary Vaynerchuk's like jab, jab, right hook or whatever. But I gave him a lot of value just for free of expecting nothing in return. And I think that got him to kind of look up to me a bit. And then when I finally hired him, you know, I, I, I've flown him to my house. I have flown him on a company retreat. You know, I, I take good care of him. And also Phil knows that like, I'm going to pay him like what I can. If I can afford to pay him this, like I continually pay him more, not because I have to, because I want him to stick around. Like I genuinely want his best. Like he genuinely wants my best. And I know for a fact that when I decide to expand into another business, Phil is probably going to be a partner or even in my business. When it gets, if I decide I want to grow it to 30, 40, $50,000 a month, Phil is going to have equity and he's going to be managing. You know, he, he understands there's more opportunities with me just because I tend to attract a lot of opportunities and we have a really strong level of trust. And I mean, I, I think the same goes to my other employees. They, they see more opportunity in working with me, you know, and they also like the fact that like, like Phil, he had a corporate job where he was treated like crap and micromanaged. I can go a whole week without messaging Phil because I'm just the most hands off. I, I mean, if you do your work and you do it well and you have my best interests, I'm not going to ask you every day about what you did. I'm not going to freak out and say you spent 30 minutes longer in a campaign than you needed to. I think, and I think my employees appreciate that hands off, you know, I trust you management style. Obviously it has to be earned and it has to be maintained, but if they can, I mean, you could pretty, it's, it's almost like he works for himself, even though he works for me. Mm. No, I, I love that. And um, I mean, you, you mentioned equity there. I, I would never do equity just cause like I, uh, and when you say equity, I assume you mean profit sharing, not an actual uh, percentage of the business itself. Eventually, I, I might consider it, honestly, depending how things go. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. As I said, for me, it's when you have 100% ownership of the money, then you can, like, for example, you can loan your money. You, like, you know, as I'm investing money uh, into real estate next year, like I can move money around between companies and through a holding company. And like, that's why I would never give hundred percent. I would never give away my hundred percent ownership because uh, it just means you can do so much, especially when you have multiple businesses, but you know, it's something I've thought about profit share. Um, yeah. you know, because as, as you said, like it, it just, then you give someone the fucking ammunition to really, really grow and really, really take on responsibility. But it's super interesting what you said there. Cause, um, first of all, I'm assuming like Phil definitely makes more money with you than he did in his corporate job. And it's still shocking to me how little some people get paid. Uh, Kieran, I mean, Kieran's been working for me for what, like 18 months, like 
to be honest, actually full time, like what, 16 months. Uh, he's getting paid two and a half times as much as he did managing 400 grand a month um, in, in retainers at, at his old agency. And, um, but even more so than that, as you said, I realized like good people want responsibility. Like, like, like B players, they just want to do as, uh, you know, they just want to do as much as they're uh, hired to do. And that's it. But A players, not only do they want to do their job, they want to do extra shit on top of that. And they want that extra responsibility. And like, it, I think it's just this sense of, as you said, like, you know, being micromanaged at, at a different business or like you have total ownership and you have that room to grow. Like, I think people, I think they, people just want to put their head on their, rest their head on their pillow and be like, I did a good day's work. And they want that fulfillment. So I definitely couldn't totally agree more. Agree. <laughs> Amazing. Well, um, dude, I think this, this thing's gone on for like 45 minutes or something like that. So um, yeah, I, honestly, I could probably keep talking to you for three, four more hours. There's, uh, there's so much uh, more to unpack. But um, yeah, I just want to thank you so much for uh, your time and, and sharing your wisdom. Yeah, thanks for the chance to get on here and talk for a little bit. And also thank you for the community you've developed.